Okay, awesome. I'm so glad to be following Heather's talk because I couldn't think of a better, like, broad overview of the evolution of sex and sex differences more broadly. Uh, I'm going to be sort of zeroing in on the sex binary, what it is, why it matters. I kind of view this talk as sort of a sanity affirmation therapy, so, uh, I, I, but I think you'll also learn some interesting facts as well, at least I hope you do. Uh, so firstly, why am I here to talk about sex? You know, this is a conference about gender medicine, so it seems weird that you'd have a couple biologists come up here talking about you know, how sex evolved and sex differences more broadly. Um, and I'm kind of as perplexed as, as all of you are. Why are we talking about what biological sex is? Uh, but there's a really good reason for this. Uh, it's because uh, a lot of ideas about sex uh, are being undermined. Uh, so there's two basic uh, pillars that a lot of the gender-affirming care medicine stands on. Um, one of them is this idea that sex is a spectrum, that sex is... Uh, comprised of a uh, conglomeration of body parts. Uh, we can't really tell what sex an individual is. We can only talk about degrees of maleness and femaleness. Sex is mutable. If you just, you know, give a male implants, they're kind of more male. If you cut off their breast, now they're, uh, sorry, implants, they're more female, cut off their breast, now they're kind of uh, more on the male side of things. And then the other pillar that gender-affirming care rests on is this notion of uh, brain sex, okay? This is being construed as sort of gender identity and brain sex. This is also being used in court documents uh, as, as a basis for gender affirming care. And this idea is that your brain can have a sex that differs from your body and that these can be out of alignment um, and can be brought into alignment. So they might have a model that kind of looks like this. So we have sort of a spectrum here. This is split into two levels. We have uh, what they would call our sex assigned at birth, which is actually the sex observed and recorded at birth. Um, and let's say that you're, oh, thank you. <laughs> I never know when I'll get the clap. Um, let's say you have someone who's just a normal female, okay? They might say that their sex assigned at birth is female, okay? This is, this is where they exist. Uh, but then they might say, oh, this is going ahead, I don't know why. Uh, they might say that they, let's say this female likes to, you know, likes sports, likes rough and tumble play. Uh, maybe they're same sex attracted as well. So they like a lot of things that are typically associated with being uh, boys or men. And so they would say something like, well, they might have a sex assigned at birth that's, that's female, but their brain sex is kind of more over here on the male side, okay? And then this is construed as this brain body mismatch, okay? And so the idea behind gender-affirming care, well, one, we can't change your brain sex. That's, that's conversion therapy in their minds. You know, we can't do anything about that. Um, but since sex is this mutable spectrum that's just comprised of body parts, well, we can give you hormones, we can give you surgeries, and we can change all those physical features that comprise one sex, and we can turn this level of dysphoria uh, sort of into, um, into alignment and give you sort of gender euphoria. So this is the, the kind of the basis for gender affirming care. And so it really matters whether or not sex is a spectrum, whether it is mutable, whether it's just comprised of a bunch of body parts that can be moved willy nilly and change your sex. Um, so uh, I'm gonna go over a couple of the arguments about why sex is actually binary, why it's not on a spectrum, uh, because that's a really important uh, aspect. It's fundamental to this entire thing. So the sex spectrum, I'm hoping to so to carve this in half and show you why that is binary. <laughs> so what is biological sex? What are the sexes? Well, the sexes, male and female, they represent two distinct reproductive strategies, these evolved reproductive roles. Okay, males are defined as the sex that produces numerous small gametes or sperm, and we see those around the center here. Uh, females are defined as the sex that yields fewer but larger gametes, or what we'd call eggs or ova. So we categorize individuals as male or female based on the type of gamete, sperm or ova, they can or are expected to produce. Uh, since there's only two types of sex cells, gametes, sperm and ova, uh, there can be only two sexes and there are only two sexes. And this binary division between these two gametes uh, forms the crux of biologists' description of sex as a binary. Now this really could be the end of the talk because that's really all you need to know <laughs> at a fundamental level. Uh, but we'll go into more detail because there's a lot of activists trying to undermine this like super basic concept. Um, okay. So 
yeah, it's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of propaganda out there. We have figures like this in Scientific American. We have YouTube videos of why biological sex is a spectrum with millions of views. Uh, this is kind of going ahead by itself. There's the Why Sex is Binary by you know, Ann Fosto Sterling in the New York Times. There's uh, Discover Magazine about why sex is a spectrum. There's books about the sex spectrum. There's you know, the Trevor Project. There's even more stuff that comes out. Scientific American is one of the leading propaganda outlets right now about this stuff. Well, here's why human sex isn't binary. Uh, San Francisco Chronicle, uh, sex binary, that's a scientific falsehood according to them. Uh, Scientific American, to understand sex, you know, says that the number of sexes differs depending on context. Uh, Washington Post, you know, we can't look at the body, we need to look at the brain to find out what sex you are, apparently. Um, so you might say, okay, well this is just a bunch of op-eds, okay? Because as long as this isn't in the scientific literature, everything should be okay. Uh-oh. So, <laughs> Nature, this is like the most prestigious journal, at least was in the entire world. Um, apparently sex has been redefined. The idea of two sexes is simplistic. Biologists now think there's a wider spectrum than that. Didn't get the memo. Uh, multivariate models of animal sex, breaking binaries leads to a better understanding of evolution, of ecology and evolution. Interesting. Uh, this is one sex gender. They won't even say the word sex as separate from gender. They want us to use the term sex gender or gender sex now. Uh, so that's being more common. There's more papers on that. These are monographs. I think this is the, uh, what is this, the American Psychological Association, their lead, their flagship journal. Um, and then there's hormones and behavior. This is a new paper. This I think just a couple of weeks old. Uh, this is at least used to be a serious scientific publication. Um, Let's look at the conclusion. This is, I couldn't have imagined ever reading something like this in a scientific paper. Uh, they said, to be clear, this is a call to arms, hold on me, uh, <laughs> to implement this deconstructionist approach in lieu of binary sex frameworks, move away from this hypersimplistic sex model, and conceptualize sex and non-sex physiologies as multiple interacting variable and unbounded by gender limitations. <laughs> so this is... We're in like a full court press now of like the scientific literature getting crazy. So uh, the arguments against the sex binary are kind of um, in two main categories. The first I call sex expansionism. And this is the idea that there are more than two sexes. Okay, so rather than there just being males and females, uh, maybe there's four, four sexes, six sexes, eight sexes, one more four. <laughs> and uh, so that's, that's one idea of it. This is different than sort of other arguments forward. Uh, what I call sex eliminationist arguments, which is this idea that uh, instead of those two sexes, um, rather sex is, exists on a spectrum. There's, forward more here. Uh, we can't really talk about males and females per se, um, but males and females are this, these statistical realities. You can only approximate uh, slightly. You can have degrees of maleness and femaleness, but you cannot be male or female. And again, this is viewed as like a mutable thing. So we're going to go more into sex expansionism here, and I'll go over one of the arguments for these, uh, this type of argument. Um, so the idea uh, that of, for sex expansionism is that, um, sorry, go forward here. So it's based on this misinterpretation uh, of the idea that sex is determined by chromosomes. Now that's a true statement, but there's a lot of misconceptions over what that actually means. Um, so a lot of people, including people who I would say on our side who are trying to defend the reality of the sex binary, will say something like, oh, sex is determined by chromosomes. If you're XX, you're female. If you're XY, you're male. That's what they think the sex binary is, end of debate. Um, but then activists will then point out saying like, well, there's, there's more uh, compositions of sex chromosomes beyond just XX and XY. We have, uh, you know, Jacobs syndrome. We have triple X syndrome, Kleinfelter, Turner, uh, XXYY syndrome. We have all these different categories. And so they would say, well, if sex is determined by chromosomes, then we have way more than two sexes here because look at all these different uh, compositions that we can have. Um, so this is fundamentally based on this misinterpretation or this uh, confusion, uh, conflation of how sex is determined with how sex is defined, okay? So I'm gonna kind of go over what those mean. So broadly speaking, we have what are called sex determination systems, okay? These are uh, the mechanisms that cause an individual to develop down a pathway that leads to the existence of a male or a female. 
In humans and birds, we have a chromosomal sex determination, uh, but some other animals, like a lot of reptiles, they have temperature-dependent sex determination. Uh, so the, whether they develop into males or females uh, depends on the temperature at which their, the eggs were incubated, okay? So completely different. It's an environmental factor. Other species do it with, you know, uh, social uh, surroundings, you know, how dense the population is uh, can determine whether they go down a certain pathway that leads to being a male or a female. Um, there's a lot of different sex determination systems, um, but ultimately they're creating just two sexes. So when we're talking about what sex an individual is, all we're talking about is whether this individual has the reproductive capacity to produce sperm or ova, okay? That's what sex is, that's all sex is. Sex is not sex determination systems, that's a whole different thing. And then there's like some downstream consequences of sex, uh, which are you know, differences in morphology, physiology, and behavior. Heather did a great job going over a lot of these things. Um, you know, antlers uh, that are evolved in, in male deer, you know, they're different behaviors when they go into the rut. Uh, you know, humans are sexually dimorphic. There's dimorphism in the types of hormonal milieus that we're producing. You know, those are all downstream consequences of sex. So it's important to bracket these three things. We have sex determination mechanisms. These are sort of the upstream causes of sex. Then we have sex itself, definitely binary. The upstream causes are not binary. And then we have the downstream consequences, uh, which is all the morphology, physiology, behavior. And again, those things are not binary either. No one's ever claiming that they are. Uh, but it's just important to say that all those things are not sex per se, except for the middle thing. That's what it means to be male or female. So forward. Okay, so armed with that knowledge, <laughs> we're gonna, we can reclassify what all these different uh, you know, what they would posit as uh, multiple sexes are. Forward. Again. Uh, so we have, we can see that they're actually just composed of two sexes, males and females. Uh, yes, so just two sexes, you know, because they're trying to conflate sex determining systems or sex, uh, you know, chromosomes with outcomes, but really those are just uh, different compositions, different chromosomal compositions within the male and female category. So we're gonna go back uh, and now talk about sex eliminationism, uh, which again is this notion that uh, sex exists on this spectrum uh, of, of individuals where you can only statistically approximate sexes, sexes aren't real. Um, it's, it's interesting to point out that these arguments are actually in conflict with like the sex expansionist approach, because if you don't think sex is real, then you certainly don't think there's a finite number like five or six or whatever, but they never debate with one another. It's always them, those two groups, which are actually the same people, uh, debating with people like me, who say there's only two sexes. Because the goal isn't really to have, you know, the, find out how many sexes there are or destroy sexes. It's really just there can't be two in their minds. Like, that's the only thing. So you get the same people using arguments about, you know, there's five sexes, and then they'll flip once you destroy that argument, and they'll say, oh, well, sex isn't even a thing at all. So it's, it's, it just depends on the context, however they can win an argument. Um, so this is, uh, you usually hear these types of arguments, the sex elimination ones sec is uh, encapsulated in the, uh, the term sex is a spectrum. And this has two main sort of arguments to argue that sex is a spectrum. One is based on intersex conditions and the other is based on uh, secondary sex characteristics. So intersex conditions are basically these conditions that people can have that result in the appearance of ambiguous sex in terms of their genitalia or sort of a mismatch between their, their chromosomes and their outward appearance of sex. Um, and then secondary sex characteristics are basically the differences that arise during puberty. You know, men, uh, males grow taller, we get more upper body strength, we have our voices get lower, uh, more facial hair, women develop breasts, um, they have wider hips and certain fat distributions. So these are things that develop you know, downstream. These are the downstream consequences of sex. And they're called secondary sex characteristics for a reason. It's because they're secondary to what it means to be male or female. Um, so uh, let's go forward. So we're gonna talk about the intersex conditions first, the argument from intersex conditions. So this, I think, has been stated very clearly by Alice Drager. Um, and she said in her book, um, I think it was Hermaphrodites and the Medical Invention of Sex. Um, when she says hermaphrodites, she means intersex people. So just keep that in mind. So she said that 
Hermaphroditism causes a great deal of confusion, more than one might first appreciate, because, as we will see again and again, the discovery of a hermaphroditic body raises doubts not just about the particular body in question, but about all bodies. The questioned body forces us to ask what exactly it is, if anything, that makes the rest of us unquestionable. So I think that's kind of the distillation of the argument from intersex conditions, saying that some people are intersex, what really is sex? We can't really say anything about anyone's sex if some people are, you know, have these conditions that sort of blur this line. But this might sound like really profound if you don't like know anything about what males or females are, uh, but it's, it's just sort of the pseudoscientific woo-woo. Like there's, it's just completely not true that because some people might, you know, who are at a glance difficult to place in a male or female box, you know, based on their genitalia, that we're all somehow in this, you know, cast into this realm of complete uncertainty. Like that's just not the case. Most people like a coin flip are either male or female. You know, you don't get a coin flip that's 70% heads on a single flip. It's either going to be heads or tails. And maybe you'll get, you know, with a nickel, I think one out of every 6,000 flips will land on its edge. Uh, that doesn't negate the existence of a heads or a tails. Uh, and the prevalence of intersex conditions is about the same prevalence uh, likelihood of a, a nickel landing on its edge, about one in 5,500. So uh, go forward here. Um, so we also see graphs like this, this was in Scientific American, just trying to make sex seem so, so complex that we can't say anything, we seem to throw up our hands and let people self-identify in any sex that they want to. Um, forward. So the, forward again. So the idea here is that intersex conditions aren't evidence that there aren't more than two sexes or against the sex binary because intersex conditions don't result in uh, reproductive systems that can or would or did produce a third or fourth type of gamete. So they would need to produce something like a spurg or a speg in order for this to be, in order for an intersex condition to truly be like a new sex, okay? Again, sex ambiguity is not a third sex, okay? Intersex conditions, if you, you know, maybe we're all exposed to radiation and in future generations, you know, have 50% prevalence of intersex conditions, that still wouldn't mean there's more than two sexes, it would just mean there's a lot of people who are difficult to place at a glance. You know, they have, they have intermediate appearing genitalia, there would still only be two sexes. So the prevalence of intersex conditions has no bearing whatsoever on how many sexes there are. Sex is still binary, no matter how many, you know, the prevalence of intersex conditions. Okay, so we're gonna move on to the uh, arguments from secondary sex characteristics, and remember these are the characteristics that sort of differentiate during puberty. Um, we're talking like Adam's apples in men, facial hair, upper body strength, breasts in women, etc. Um, this is in scientific papers, but it's also in, in your child's classroom. Uh, this is the gender-bred person, a lot of you have probably seen this before, and we're just going to zero in and see how they describe biological sex. So zooming in, one, they won't even say male or female. They just say maleness or femaleness, and they all start from zero and go to wherever. Um, <laughs> and the description of biological sex here is the physical sex characteristics you're born with and develop, including genitalia, body shape, voice pitch, body hair, hormones, chromosomes, etc. They don't even mention gametes, which is the universal defining feature of males and females across in the entirety of life. Um, and they're using things like body shape and voice pitch. This determines your sex. Like a, a hairy girl is like more of a male. Um, yeah, go forward. <laughs> so they even like have these sliding scales that are like examples. Uh, here's, here's a male, and you know it's sort of intermediate on the male part, uh, and it, it's it's completely you know ridiculous. Now you can go forward. Um, so if we take this idea seriously, dead seriously, and say like, okay, maybe secondary sex characteristics do define your sex. Let's see where that leads us. Um, so you might see figures like this, they'll say that, well, you know, breasts, uh, how tall individuals are, these are secondary characteristics. Uh, they exist on like this bimodal spectrum, and they would say either a combination of characteristics or characteristics by themselves, uh, sort of cluster like this, and you know, we have, you know, males are the ones that kind of cluster in the male hump over there, and females are kind of, we classify those as the individuals that approximate the features that are on the female hump. Um, but if we want to take them seriously and start like asking what certain individuals along these uh, along this graph actually represent, uh, we can just start asking something like, you know, is male 
A more male than male B? What, what is on the x-axis? Is this penis size? Is this voice pitch? Is this body hair? Like, again, this is completely ridiculous. Uh, is female D, are they more female than female C? Again, what is on this, uh, what, what is being measured here? Um, and so I, there's a scenario I like to bring up here that really shows this isn't just scientifically flawed, but it's socially regressive and I think equally sexist to both males and females, both men and women. Um, <laughs> thank you. So we can imagine a scenario where you have this, this, this boy, um, maybe he just went through puberty, it wasn't, uh, you know, di didn't produce t typical masculine features, he's quite short, he doesn't have much facial hair to speak of, his voice didn't really drop very much, very effeminate, maybe he discovered he's now same-sex attracted, um, he's getting relentlessly bullied on the playground because you know, of all these effeminate characteristics and everyone else is, all the other guys are playing football or whatever, doing, you know, traditionally masculine stuff. And they're bullying him relentlessly and, you know, they're teasing him and they're saying, what are you, a girl? You look, you look like a girl. You have all these, you know, feminine features. And then Billy's very distraught, you know, crying, goes to his teacher, you know, to, to try to uh, ask the teacher what's going on. Um, he says, teacher, they're calling me a girl. You know, is this true? Like, what's, what's going on here? And the teacher thinks long and hard, thinks about the sex spectrum, everything they've learned, <laughs> thinks about the gender-bred person, what they've learned from the gender unicorn, what they've le learned from the gender elephant. And he pauses, pauses long and hard, and he thinks to himself and then responds to Billy, maybe you are a girl. <laughs> and this is really what we, where it leads when you go down this pathway that we're defining what it means to be a boy or a girl, or a man or a woman, or male or female, by these secondary sex characteristics. Billy, under this, you know, this idea, would be a girl. Like, that's, that's just where it leads. It's, it's very socially regressive. So, let's go forward. So what does a graph like this actually mean? So, um, let's say, let's put a feature. Let's say this is height or something, a secondary uh, trait that we have that makes us differentiate during puberty. Well, instead of becoming more or less male and female as you move right or left across this graph, what we have really is well, there's two populations here. This is not just one population, there's two. Um, and that population is comprised of two sexes, males and females. And so when you're moving left or right across this graph, you're not becoming you know, more female and intersex and then male. What's happening is the proportion of individuals who are males and females is rises and falls depending on where you are across uh, as, as height increases or decreases. That's all that means. There's still two populations here. They're still just males or females. Um, and this is... Again, this is really basic. This is stuff you guys obviously already know about. It's intuitive, uh, again, sanity affirmation therapy. <laughs> so um, these arguments aren't even, you know, they're both wrong, but they're also self-refuting. The, this idea that sex is a spectrum or exists on multiple levels, um, and we can just talk about your chromosomal sex or your hormonal sex or your brain sex and all that stuff. Um, they're self-refuting because they all fundamentally rely on the, 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 the sex binary, the binary gametes, okay? Because how could we know that people who are XX tend to be females and those who are XY tend to be males unless we knew what, that males and females were something apart from their chromosomal makeup? How do we know that crocodiles are males and females based on the temperature that they're incubated at if we didn't already know that sex was something apart from the temperature that they're incubated? How do we know that males tend to have penises and females, humans, tend to have vaginas if we didn't know that sex was something apart from whether you have a penis or a vagina? How do we know that testosterone is associated with being male and estrogen is associated with being female if we didn't already know that sex is something apart from your hormonal makeup? Uh, same with morphology. How do we know that females, human females tend to have breasts, uh, breasts develop, that males tend to grow beards if we didn't know that their sex was something apart from their beards and their breasts. Uh, <laughs> forward. And also behavior. How do we know that males are more aggressive? How do we know it's the male deer that uh, you know, engage in this, this fierce combat and elephant seals if we didn't know that their sex was something apart from their behaviors? And what's the thing that is the reference point for all of these things? The gametes. <laughs> Whether or not the individual is producing sperm or ova. So what they're trying to spread out as these multiple levels of sex it's really just all rooted in gametes. So their arguments don't even get off the ground before they start because they all presuppose that this is the true 
general understanding and meaning of what it means to be male and female. So, I think I know what next slide is. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah. So what's going on here in uh, the biology of sex? So you might have heard that we used to think back in the day that uh, you know, the, the Earth was the center of the solar system, okay? All our hubris, we thought, you know, humans are so great, where this must be the center of not just the solar system, but the universe itself. And so we, when we made these models of a solar system, naturally we put the Earth in the center. Um, and then we make observations about the motions of all the other planets. And you know, it makes, there's a lot of weird stuff going on out there if we assume that the Earth is the center. Okay, we see like Mars's motion, and it's doing these weird loop-de-loops, and so we have to make these these loop-de-loops in our model of the solar system. They call these epicycles. They add them to them. Um, then all the other planets are doing this, and they'll find some other anomaly, and they gotta add more of these loop-de-loops so they're not just orbiting the Earth, but they're also uh, sort of orbiting something else in the orbit. Uh, of course, it's all crazy uh, because you know, there's no explanation for these epicycles. They were just needed because the observations were just out of whack. So they needed to construct these more and more complex models of the solar system to account for the fact that they were just wrong about where the center of gravity was. Uh, so when they finally came to their, sentence, uh, their senses and said maybe, just maybe the sun is the center of the, our solar system, then it changed this incredibly complex patchwork model, super complex thing into this. <laughs> this is very elegant and it, per, it comports with the scientific principle of parsimony, which means you, know, you don't make a model more complex you know, all else being equal, the model that's the least complex tends to be, or should be favored, okay? Um, and this is a perfect example. This is incredibly parsimonious. It explains, like, the Mars retrograde motion, of, and the same with uh, Mercury, you know, and all you had to do is just move one little variable to the center, okay? And so we improved. We went from a place of more complexity to a place of more elegance and simplicity and much more explanatory power. Okay, go forward. So here's what happens in biology right now. This is a new paper. It's called Multivariate Models of Animal Sex. They want to break the binaries. They want to dethrone gametes from being the center of gravity in sex biology. And here's what happens when you move gametes from the center of gravity in sex biology. <laughs> this is a real figure from the paper. This is, I didn't make this up. This is a real figure. They want to just say, oh, gamete size, that's just one aspect of sex. You have hormones, morphology, behavior. Before, and then they say, that this is a new model, this is a multivariate model of animal sex as a collection of traits representative as individual lines that contribute to the overall sex phenotype. Each trait has its own distribution, which may or may not be bimodal or coincide with other traits. It's just, everything's thrown up in the air. We don't, we don't know, there's, there's nothing that is inherently tying any of these together. I would argue that this is sort of the biological equivalent of an epicycle. But instead of going from a place of complexity and confusion to an area of simplicity, we're moving away from the complicity and explanatory power of gametes as the center of gravity in the sex solar system to this place of we don't know what's going on anymore. We're pretending like we don't understand what's going on. And this is, you know, we're, we're, we're regressing. We're going away from parsimony. We're go adding unneeded complexity. Um, and we really need to, you know, get things back on track because this is being used, again, I said in court to justify trying to change kids' sex, so it really matters that whether or not you actually can change someone's sex and what sex is. Uh, we need to return to sort of natural biology, and that's why people like Heather are necessary to come up here and talk about that. And that's why it's important to understand the sex binary, and that's why it matters. So, thank you so much. So they said I can take a few questions. I'll just assume that when I hear a voice, I'll just look up. Hi, Ooh. Um, Michael Reddy. I'm a family physician, uh, dedicated headache practice for 15 years. And I don't know if this is a question or a comment, but something that you said just popped a light on. And I, I, I came to practice around the time of the opiate crisis. And that was based a lot on self-identification. And I hear a lot of the echoes of that in this. And I became a follower of Dr. John Sarna, who was very big into mind-body evidence and uh, mind-body syndrome. And he would always say, the only place the mind is separate from the body is in anatomy textbooks. And the thought that popped into my mind was, how is this not a different form of conversion therapy? And everyone is talking about, oh, conversion therapy is bad. 
but why is it not then bad to bring yeah. the body in line no, I, to I, the mind? I think that's, that's a point I've made before. Like this idea that conversion therapy is, you know, we're trying to change the minds of gay people to match the, their body. Uh, well, this is just achieving that through the opposite. We're changing their body to try to match their minds. Change, and it's you know mainly happening with with kids who are same sex attracted because they tend to be the more gender non conforming ones and if you would normally naturally grow up to just be a, a gay adult um, who's happily gender non conforming you know or not uh, and then you're changing their body and now claiming that this person is now straight I, I don't see how that isn't just conversion therapy by another name it's um, yeah it's it's I totally agree. Colin, thanks so much for your talk. Thank you. Um, I've been bursting with this question since you were speaking. And what I want to try to understand, you may not know, but so we are, we are living in a world where truth and reality are ceasing to exist. And as you showed, as you demonstrated, the gender-bred person, the spectrum of maleness, femaleness, traits, characteristics. When this, when this is going into scientific journals, where was the pushback from our colleagues in science and medicine? It, it's not, as you pointed out, it's not that complicated what what defines a male or a female? And how did it get this far? And why has it been allowed? Because I, I, I cannot understand why there hasn't been more resistance to this message that has been allowed to really infect society. That's how I see it. Yeah, no, I'm I, mean, very I, I agree. It's, it's completely insane. And it, I've been talking about this for five years. And there's, I can still count the people who talk about this, the biologists who are speaking up. One of them's here, two of them, Carol as well. There's probably some others who are in the audience, but at least biologists with the platform uh, of any significant degree, there's still so few of us talking about this. Um, some journals are starting to open up a little bit. I've been contacted by some, some editors who sort of want me to be publishing pieces here to push back against some of this, just to have some sort of, uh, you know, um, counter argument in the scientific literature because right now they're just, they're just running rampant through everything and they see what happens when people like me or Carol speak up. I mean, they go after us super hard. I mean, I have to have a sub, a sub stack that's keeping me uh, so I, don't, I can't be canceled anymore to talk about this stuff. That gives me the ability to come up here and talk about this stuff because, you know, the biologists out there see what happened to people like me, like Carol, like, like Heather. And they, it sends a signal that if you talk about this, we're going to try to cancel you as well. This isn't comport with DEI. You're making students feel unsafe on campus by publishing these types of things. Uh, that's, that's the mes message that's out there right now. So um, yeah, I, I, th I think it's getting better. It's, it is less controversial to talk about this. I mean, we, I could never have talked to a room like this about this. You know, five years ago, it was unheard of. We weren't organized, but now we are. And I think that's just, we're moving in the right direction. More people are going to talk about it. I just had a paper, um, well, uh, I had a book chapter um, with Emma Hilton in a peer-reviewed book, in a village book about sex and gender. Um, so now it can finally be cited, the sex binary. I, I, I joke that we're going to be given like the Nobel Prize for rediscovering the sex binary. Uh, so I'll happily accept. But yeah, we, we, need, we need more papers. We need things to cite. We can't just be citing Quillette articles uh, on this stuff because it makes us look crazy. But um, yeah, the world is crazy. So. Okay, one last question. Hi, one more. Um, particularly, how do we get this basic intelligent information, particularly Heather's, into the K through 12 curriculum? How do we do that? That's what's needed. Yeah, uh, you know, that's, <laughs> that's a good question. I mean, I think it needs to start as local as possible. Try to get on the school boards um, as much as you can to you know, try to take control of the mechanisms that will allow you to have some say over what's in your, your student's classroom. And I know that some states like California have passed these sort of legislation about, you know, gender affirming care that can be taught. And so there might be difficulties there, but I really think it starts, you know, close by as much as you can, getting on school boards, trying to overturn those, trying to bring things to a place of sanity. 
Um, a lot of the gender affirming people, you know, a lot of these are sort of childless activists and they're just busybodies. They have a lot of free time because they don't have kids. <laughs> and so there are the ones that are joining these boards um, and causing all this havoc uh, on all the people who, who have kids uh, and whose kids are affected by their policies. So we need to be as much of bit, as busybodies as they are, um, which will make us even more busy because we're, we shouldn't have to do this and it can't be a full-time job. So we, need to, we, need to, we just need a rally, <laughs> I think, uh, to say the least. Thank you.